Can I have your attention? Hello and welcome. My name is Donna Lucas and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of PPIC Board of Directors. We're pleased to present this program today featuring the two candidates for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you, Assemblyman Tony Thurman and Marshall Tuck for joining us today for this important conversation. This event is part of the PPIC 2018 Speaker Series on California's Future. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors who make this possible. These organizations are listed um, on the screen somewhere, maybe, or on your program. Take a look at your program. That's where you'll see them. Uh, this, this program is also fe uh, supported by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle. These are groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Funding from sponsors and donors makes programs like today possible and providing you with this great free lunch. So thank you to our sponsors. I might add this is the third speaker series we've had in, what did you say, Mark? Nine days. So the PPIC staff has been very busy bringing this to you. Um, at PPIC, we want to remind you of a few housekeeping items. We're always trying to improve our events, so later today you'll get an email asking for your opinion. Please respond and give us your honest opinion. We would love that. And also, can you take a minute to turn your phones off so we don't have any interruption? And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Mark Baldessari, the President and CEO of PPIC. Thank you, Thank Mark. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I was uh, telling Assemblymember Thurman and, and uh, Marshall Tuck that uh, we had uh, such a, an amazing response to this event, which really indicates just how important this is uh, to the state of California. I, instead of um, giving the the bio, the bio that is in uh, your program, I'm just going to, um, you know, introduce our the two candidates for the nonpartisan uh, state superintendent of public instruction, um, the way that you will see them on the ballot. And that would be um, uh, Marshall Tuck, uh, Schools Improvement Director, and Tony Thurman, Educator and State Legislator. And so I, I encourage you to read more about their biographies. And they both have come to the, these positions with, uh, with lots of experience and tremendous enthusiasm. And I just wanted to mention why uh, PPIC has chosen this uh, to have an event on, on this topic. And that is because um, for us, Education is, of course, the biggest part of the state budget. It is also critical to the state's future. And it is one of the areas of focus that, that we've identified and that's part of our uh, plans and work. And so a year ago or more, when we thought about the 2018 program, we said this is something we have to do. And it's such, such, so important for us to bring this uh, to you. Let me just mention a couple of things about PPIC because there is an election coming up, so just so that you know. Uh, PPIC <laughs> and how this, how this relates to us. PPIC is, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, so we do not take any positions on candidates uh, or parties or ballot measures. Um, and uh, in order to make sure that this uh, program is handled in the way that is uh, as fair and neutral as possible, we have a clock on the stage so that our candidates will each be speaking for uh, three minutes. And we will do, do this in um, alphabetical order. They're pretty close in alphabetical order, that is. So the, the, who gets the first one, um, then who gets the second one um, for three minutes. So our purpose in doing this event is really to help you understand how important this uh, decision is that you will be making as voters and how important it is uh, for the state. 
And so we want to give you an opportunity to hear firsthand from the two candidates who will be on the ballot about their vision and get a sense of what their leadership style is. So most of you know that uh, when I'm not being president of PPIC, I'm being a pollster for PPIC. So I have a couple of questions for the audience that I think will maybe help our, our, our two candidates here too. First of all, um, how many of you have not made up your minds yet about who you're voting for for the state superintendent of schools? If you can raise your hands. Okay. You notice there's only one person on this stage who's, who's raised their hand. <laughs> you know, okay, so I'm very interested in this too. Um, and of those of you who ha have made up your mind, um, how many, for how many of you, uh, raise, raise your hands if you have made up your mind. I don't care who you're voting for, but you've made up your mind. But you've come here, that's, keep your hands up. Um, if you think you might hear something today that could change your mind, Hands down. Okay. So you got your work cut out for you today, <laughs> all right? You ready for this? We are Okay, ready. good, all right. So it's a pleasure to be, it's an honor to be on stage with, with these two gentlemen. And we agreed to one opening question. And then as you know, um, I will ask some questions and there will be some questions that we've collected from the audience which will come and we'll, we'll use in a moment. But the question which we shared in advance we're going in alphabetical order, um, is um, if elected, what will be your top three priorities as the state superintendent of public instruction? Assembly Member Thurman. I guess I'm up. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the opportunity. You know, I think our top priority has to be increasing funding for public education. Uh, the fact that we're 46 in the nation in per pupil spending when California is the fifth, uh, wealthiest economy in the world uh, means that we've got to make a huge change. And as superintendent, I will prioritize making our education system funded within the top 10 of all states within the first four years and take us to number one within eight years because our kids are number one. They deserve to know that they are number one. Uh, additionally, I'll focus on closing the achievement gap. Uh, we've got to make sure that all of our students, regardless of their background, have an opportunity to learn and to be successful. And we'll use programs like a literacy campaign to address our literacy shortages. We'll use programs like um, the Freedom School program that helps African Americans um, improve their literacy and an incredible uh, program that the Napa County Office of Education is using to help um, you know, uh, Latin, Latino students improve their literacy in early education. I'll work with our next governor to create a universal preschool program because we know that the achievement gap starts before kindergarten and we've got to make sure that we support each and every one of our students and then finally just working to make sure that our students are prepared for the jobs of tomorrow. There are estimates that there'll be a million and a half jobs in technology and California will have only half the applicants for those jobs. We've got to change the conversation to invest in more STEAM programs, more career technical education, bilingual education so our students can be the global leaders of tomorrow. And these are things that I prioritize in the legislature. I'm happy to tell you about them, but I want to tell you this. People always say to me, Tony, you should focus on the kids who demonstrate promise and potential. I happen to think that all of our kids develop promise and potential. And I'm running for this office because I believe that regardless of any of our students' circumstances, that they can and that they will achieve, and that a quality education is key to that. That's been the narrative of my own life. Uh, you know, I was on the free lunch program. Uh, I was on the food stamps program. We ate so much government cheese, I thought USDA was a brand name. Uh, you know, I lost my mother at the age of six. My father, who was a Vietnam veteran who never came home from the war, and I was raised by a cousin who I never met until I showed up on her doorstep, and she saved my life and she ensured that I got a great public education. I think about it all the time, how I could have ended up in California State Prison. Instead, I ended up in the California State Assembly. I want to give that to all six million of the kids that we serve in this great state. Thank you. I know that there are many educators in the room, and I think that there are opportunities for us to come together. We may not agree on every single issue, but it's important that we agree that every one of our students deserves to get a great education. And I've built a lifetime as a career serving young people and working directly with young people. This year I taught a class in the juvenile camp because I believe that all kids can learn and together we can ensure that all of our kids get a great education. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks. And Michael. Hey. 
thanks, Mark, for hosting. Thanks, all the folks at, at PPIC. N nine events or uh, three events in nine days is quite impressive. So thank you guys for doing it. And thank you all here in the audience. Um, many of you work in education, do a lot of good work for our kids, and, and looking forward to working with many of you for a long time. We've got a long way to go as a state. Um, when we talk about priorities, I think we have to start with the fact that our state has not prioritized our kids or our public schools. We've got to come out and say that. And you know, I believe that a public school is just an essential part of a community. I believe that every single child, especially in the 21st century, must have a quality education to have a chance to be who they want to be and have the most fulfilling life. But the reality right now in our state is we are not giving that to all kids in nowhere close. As we're all having lunch right now, there's 6.2 million kids in public schools in the state of California, and over 3 million can't read and write at grade level. And we have to ask, how is that possible in this wealthy state with so many great kids and so many hardworking educators? It's because our state has not prioritized our kids in our schools, and we have to change that. The system isn't working. So on specific policy priorities, where do we start? We must start with equity. We have a public school system right now where our Latino and African-American kids perform far, far worse than our white and Asian kids, and has been that way for decades. It is fundamentally unequal, and it is broken, and we must shift it. So where do we start on that? There's a lot of issues to close the achievement gap. But right away, day one, we're going to shift the policy that was put in place by the state superintendent. We're going to make sure that Governor Brown's low control funding formula, the dollars are actually getting to the kids of greatest need. It is absolutely essential that our neediest kids get those dollars. <laughs> Secondly, we've got to unlock the creativity and innovation of our teachers and our principals. And that starts with me by taking that education code, 2,500 pages, and making that much, much, much smaller so we can actually have those that are closest to kids, teachers, principals, counselors, being able to innovate and truly bring our schools into the 21st century. We gotta make real changes. I wanna work with superintendents up and down the state, get waivers immediately from the education code, from the state board, over time work with the legislature to drive real change. And third, we have to deal with funding. And we can't just talk about funding as a priority. Because Sacramento politicians have been talking about funding as a priority for decades, and we are still 41st. We gotta go from talking about funding to action. This is a state that has not funded its public schools. This is a state that over and over and over again has had members of the legislature, elected leaders say, we're gonna focus on funding, we're gonna focus on funding. The schools I led, I worked in education for 15 years. We raised $100 million for two school systems. That was called getting more money for our kids. It's time for our state to get serious about funding our schools. Equity, truly embracing, supporting, and empowering our teachers and principals, and getting serious about not just prioritizing funding, but actually doing something about it and making the hard decisions that are necessary to fund our kids and give them what they deserve, which is a wonderful education. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to ask a favor of my friends in the audience, we, we had a chance to, to do some applause, which I thought was appropriate in the first uh, round of questions. But uh, just in the interest of time, because um, actually <laughs> applause takes time, if we can hold it to the end, I promise <laughs> we, can, um, we, can, you know, we can all yell and scream and, and, and um, you know, stand on our chairs if you want at the end. So let's uh, let, let, do, do me a favor on that. So, uh, Marshall, I want to ask you uh, a question, um, which we ask Californians all the time um, in our polling. How would you grade California's public schools today? If you, if you had to give a, a grade, what would the grade be? And what are the metrics that you use? What are the key metrics for how you determine the grade that you give schools today? And you can use pluses and minuses with the, with the letters, too, if you want. Yeah. Our job as a state is both built into our constitution, and it's, it's, it's a moral responsibility, is to give every single child access to a quality public school and a quality education. That is our job, it's both in our constitution and a real moral responsibility. And right now, the majority of kids in this state are not getting it. One in 10 African-American males that starts the ninth grade graduates prepared for college one in 10, in the great state of California. Three million kids can't read and write at grade level in the great state of California. 
our English learners are 12% proficient in English in the wealthiest state in the nation. The system is not working. And it's okay, we have tons of hardworking people. I've been a part of the system for 15 years. We're working real hard. The reality is, is that the elected leadership in this state has not gotten the job done on our public schools. Does not mean that there aren't hardworking people right and left. Doesn't mean we're not passing good policy here or there. But we've access, accepted an education system, an education establishment, that on every single metric, particularly when you look at the results for our low-income kids, particularly looking at the results for our Latino students, which are 55% of our student population, we're not getting their graduation rates. We're not getting their on proficiency rates. We're still suspending way too many kids. Special education, we are disproportionately pushing African-American males into special education at just incredible numbers. Average, average special ed in the state, 12% for all kids, 26% for African-American males. It is, it is not working, and we need change. We need somebody who's actually done this work before. I've been in education for 15 years. I've led two different school systems in Watts, Inglewood, South LA. We found strong principals. We paid principals more to come in to work at the toughest schools. We invested in our teachers and gave our teachers more professional development. We raised more money for our schools. We got our parents more involved in our schools. And we saw unique success in terms of graduation rates, academic achievement, in terms of decrease in suspension, decrease in expulsions. It is possible. But the bottom line is it's not working, and that's why we need leadership change. We can't keep, particularly for the state superintendent, the top education position in the state, it should not be a career politician. It should be held by an educator who's actually delivered change, who's turned around schools, who's gonna work with all of our collective capacity in this room, in this state, to do whatever it takes to give every single child the education they deserve. It will be hard, it will take time. We've neglected our kids for decades, but we can do it. We've all worked with kids. We know what's possible. We step up, we believe in them. We know what's possible. So let's get together, let's get this state moving on public education in a real way, let's bring real change, and I'm excited to be a part of that. A, B, C, D, F. <laughs> D. Okay. Plus or minus, no? Okay. Huh. So, you know, I'm gonna try to be strength-based in how I answer what's really a complicated question, because our kids aren't deficits, and the reality is, is that there are a lot of places where we need to do better. And this is how I would say, I would say that our grade is mixed and that some students do very well and clearly there are many students who do not do well. And unfortunately, the way a student performs and does right now has a lot to say about the neighborhood and the zip code where they go up. And so that means we've got to fundamentally change the way we approach education in this state and in this country, mind you, one out of five kids in this state live in poverty. And we know that that places them at great risk to be impacted negatively by what I call the opportunity gap. It doesn't mean that they can't perform, but they don't get the opportunities to prepare them for the future. And so, to me, what's key about this job, no superintendent is gonna be in a position to single-handedly change all of these things. Uh, a superintendent's got to be able to work with the 58 county superintendents, has got to be able to work with the legislature, and has got to be able to work with the governor to bring resources that will allow us to recruit more teachers. We have a huge teacher shortage in this state. And when we recruit those teachers, we've got to be able to provide them with the best professional development and training so they can support our students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. We've got to acknowledge that there are social economic you know, disadvantages that many of our students have faced, and that many of our students have experienced trauma and are hungry and are homeless. And that's why I introduced a bill that makes it possible for 400,000 more kids to be able to get access to the free and reduced lunch program in our state. Because how do you learn when you're hungry? In some districts, we have as many as 20,000 homeless kids in our state. It's why in my entire career, in 20 years as a social worker, working with students in after school programs, teaching life skills, teaching career training, teaching civics, that I've always focused on how we do community schools. And I'm very proud of my legislation, AB 1014, that sent $35 million to 30 school districts in our state to create community schools so that kids who need access to health care and mental health programs get the resources that they need to help them to be able to take advantage of the educational opportunities that exist for them. Uh, I've introduced legislation to create a teacher housing program 
because in our state, many of our teachers tell us that they cannot afford to live in the communities where they work. And as superintendent, I will sponsor legislation to make sure that we provide a scholarship to anyone who wants to become a teacher. And we're going to be piloting a program in two months where we talk about how we can recruit African American and Latino male teachers to work in elementary school because that's proven to help close the achievement gap because we know that these are the kinds of things, that's a great place to put your hands together. <laughs> we know that these are the kinds of things that will help to change the narrative. Anyone can sit up here and point the finger at someone who's been elected and say that they failed our state. I'm coming to you with solutions and saying my experience as a legislator, I have a track record of success, I've been an educator, and I have the experience working with a governor and a legislature to get resources and to get things done in the public system. And together, all of us will get things done for all of our kids. So, a grade about where we are currently, our schools all together an overall grade? I haven't given it any thought from a grade standpoint. I'll just say this, I think our kids are more than a test score. Um, I know that we've created an accountability measure, a dashboard that gives people a chance to look at all the factors in our schools, our, our, our graduation rates, which I think are up, uh, suspensions, which are, have been decreased. But until we can say that we're providing a quality education for every single student, then it's not good enough. I would say our grade is not good enough and we have a lot of work to do to support every single student in our state. Okay. So uh, the, the achievement gap, um, it's a topic that's come up here a few times already today in the few minutes that we've started, and a, a very important topic. When, when I look at the dashboards, and I, I went and looked at the dashboard um, yesterday for the district that I live in, and um, saw what the overall scores were and then dug into it a little bit and, and looked at the racial disparities um, in our district and, and looked at, at the difference, uh, the, the experiences of uh, students with disabilities, other groups. I mean, clearly we've got, we've got an issue around closing the achievement gap and, and reducing racial disparities. These are not new issues. They're issues that, that people have come to us, the voters of California, before and said we have solutions we're going to make progress. Um, I'd really like to hear your specific plans and then your specific plans around closing the achievement gap and reducing racial disparities because they may be the most important issues facing California today. You know, among other things, I'll start, uh, you know, with a literacy campaign um, to support our students across the board and particular students of color. Uh, I want to thank great leaders like Barbara Nemco, uh, who is the superintendent at the Napa County Office of Education, for introducing me to a great program called Footsteps to Brilliance that's been used to help support um, immigrant families around um, you know, literacy. Uh, it, it, because we know that we can't wait till kindergarten to start talking about literacy. The Freedom School model, which has been uh, created by the Children's Defense Fund, it is a program that is an Afrocentric literacy-based program that helps students of all backgrounds improve their literacy uh, by two or three grades in as little as six weeks. And so I'll prioritize our literacy programs, uh, but we've got to go beyond just what we do in preschool. I mentioned the importance of creating a universal preschool program. We've got to start earlier than that. We know from our friends at First Five about the importance of talk, read, and sing to our kids. And as they've recently helped me to understand, because I do so much work on STEAM education and STEM education that we have to talk, read, sing, and count to our children as soon as they are born because of brain development so that we're preparing our young people. Um, so, because we know that when African American students come to school, uh, they often come to school with a million fewer words uh, than their white and Asian peers because of the opportunity gap. And so we'll use literacy. I'll continue the work that we've done to reduce chronic absenteeism in our state. We know that we have some of the highest rates of chronic absenteeism for students in grades kindergarten through third grade. That means that many of these students don't learn to read by third grade. They're at greater risk for dropping out of school and ending up in the criminal justice system. And then we must get serious about how we prepare our teachers. Research has shown that the most important thing we can do to close the achievement gap is provide professional development for our teachers to make sure that we're addressing race and equity and that we give our teachers resources and tools. We spend so much time talking about blame about teachers and how to fire teachers. We spend so little time front-loading training. You know, not everyone is born knowing how to do classroom management. If I could show you a video of the first time I stood in front of a classroom, <laughs> there's so many things I would do if I had a redo. But I had the opportunity to be mentored 
by experienced teachers who helped me to understand how to be more engaging to students, how to manage the time, how to manage a big classroom size. And so when I taught the high school class, I called upon the experiences of the veteran mentor teachers who coached me. That's why this year I've introduced legislation, particularly around special education, to make sure we have a mentoring program for our teachers, to support special education teachers. I mentioned the scholarships, because if we don't recruit teachers to fill these, uh, uh, these vacancies, we'll never have the ability to close the achievement gap. And then finally, we've got to be serious about closing the school to prison pipeline. We spend more in this state on prisons than we do on K-12 education and higher education. I am proud that this week we voted on legislation to close the cash money bail system in this state because there are people sitting in jail because they can't afford to pay bail. And I've introduced a bill that taxes private prisons and forces the proceeds to go to preschool and after school programs so we can give our kids a chance to get out of the achievement gap and have a, a chance at a great life. Marshall. Um, we talk about the achievement gap, and, and, and it's, it's systematic, right? It, it's, it's the entire system, because our Latino African American students have been underperforming whites and Asians for decades, and the gap has actually not closed substantially on just about any, any metric. And so it means that we have to fundamentally change the way we are approaching public education in the state, because what we have done to date hasn't been working. And I reiterate, when I talk about a D, it's not the people working the system. It's not, it's not, certainly the kids are incredible. It's actually the fact that we have a system where Latinos and African Americans, for as long as public education, at least the last 40 years I've been paying attention, has existed, have been way, way below whites and, and, and Asians. So we, we need change. I led two different school systems. 2008, I led the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. And that was 15,000 kids, 18 schools, district public schools, lowest 5% schools, a focused turnaround effort. When we took the schools over, our graduation rates were 13 points below the district average. Mm. They're now above the district average. That, that's called closing the gap, right? That's called turnaround. And so, so what shift do you have to actually do to make that happen? And again, this is where it's essential to have, as a state superintendent, which is the top job on education, somebody who's led school systems to do this job. First, we have to deal with pre-K. The achievement gap, Ritter Elementary School, a school we worked in Watts, our kids were coming in way behind kids from Mar Vista Elementary, way behind, because they weren't getting pre-K. And in our state, if you have money, you have pre-K, and if you don't, you might not have it. Immoral, unequal, the foundation of the achievement gap. It must change. Secondly, when we think about now kids are in school, our kids of color have younger, less experienced teachers and principals that turn over more often than high-income kids. That is a fact that has been in place for decades. If we do not change that fact, and ensure that our Latino African American kids actually have teachers in front of them and principals that are gonna stay and are gonna be there, then we will never close the achievement gap. And this is where in our schools, we actually paid principals more money to come work in Watts in East LA and South LA than to work in Palisades and Beverly Hills because it's a harder job. And this is an area of contrast with myself and Assemblymember Thurman. I believe we have to differentiate pay for high poverty communities, he doesn't. I don't see how you actually attract people without more, more incentives as well as more support. Third, we need more time. Wealthier families, after school, their kids have enrichment after school. Their kids have enrichment all during the summer. Our kids of color, our, our low-income kids, they have to have more time. And so we gotta get serious again about if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're in class or in enrichment activities 25% less than higher-income kids, how do you ever close the gap? You can't do it. Our schools, we found more time, more opportunities for our young people. And then third is we gotta invest and get our parents engaged and our communities engaged. We gotta get our communities to rally around our schools. We launched a parent college in our schools. On Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., Watts, East LA, South LA, our parents went to school to learn how to get more involved in their kids' education, and we brought the resources of the county, the city, collectively to turn on these schools. This state needs to bring all of its resources focused on improving our schools with the top priority being equity. If we do that, that's actually how you close an achievement gap over time, but it has to start with people leading who actually know the work and have done the work, and that's, that's when we need change. Mark, uh, there's one other uh, rule that I'm going to enforce here today, and that is every time one person mentions another person's name, and this goes for either one, I'm going to give you a chance to, um, to, to, to have a rebuttal. If Thank you could you. be very brief. About I can it, be though. very brief. I disagree. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say this, um, and I appreciate you know, the notion about paying principals more, but if you spent time around teachers like I have, teachers work together. 
And I'm, I'm concerned that when you create a differentiated pay scale, you're creating an invitation to encourage people to teach to the test. Because that says you get certain results, you get paid a little bit better. We have some great teachers who do great things. We don't always see an immediate jump in the experience of the students. That does not reflect a lack of effort from those teachers. You have to look at the baseline where those students began. And I get invited into so many classes and to work with teachers. We should be training our teachers to work together. Give them time outside of the school day to have professional development to the new Common Core standards and to the state standards. Many teachers tell me that they're still teaching kids to memorize what's on the test. They're not getting the opportunity. To, they haven't been trained because they get asked to send one teacher representative to a training who's supposed to come back on their own time and do a turnaround training for everybody else. Who has the ability to do that when you have a classroom of 25 or 30 kids, many who might have a behavioral need? It's very difficult to do that. If we give teachers time during the summer where they can train, where they can team plan together, ways that they can support our students, and then work to increase compensation for all of our teachers. Why create a two-tier standard for our teachers to build resentment so that some teachers feel like, well, uh, my scores were better so I get more money, and, and even though you've worked just as hard, uh, it's not, our kids are more than a test score, and I think that we should be doing a job to increase pay for all of our teachers, and that's what I hear when I'm spending time with teachers and when I've been a teacher to know that our kids need more than just uh, financial incentive we need to provide better compensation for all of our teachers, and then we need to provide better and uniform training for all of our educators in the state. Okay, well, Mark, so, I, I think uh, I think I got to get twenty I, seconds there because it, it, it shifted the conversation. I didn't say your name. No, no I'm just but, kidding. No, but <laughs> he didn't the, say the your point name. the point I brought up wasn't about paying for performance. It was actually about paying more for teachers and principals and counselors to work in Watts, in West Sacramento, in Oakland, in Richmond, as a way to ensure that our young people have teachers and principals that are gonna be there and stay as one of the ways. We have an unequal system today. The unequal system is you have more senior teachers in wealthier neighborhoods, thus they are actually getting more money. Like, I wanna increase teacher pay, but the point was around you actually have to increase incentives to get people to, to work in our neediest schools, both pay and support. If we wanna get serious about actually ensuring they have the instruction and the principal leadership that they need to be successful to close this gap. So okay, there's a different point in differentiation. Seconds, 10 seconds, I can do it in 10 seconds or less. Start my, start my, start my time. We're taking, over the, we're taking over the format, you know? I, I served as Not a school board member of a district <laughs> that has historically been one of the lowest performing yeah. in the state. 30,000 plus students in the state. We did turnarounds, we asked teachers to apply for their jobs, we, we figure out ways to support our students. We didn't give this differential pay scale, but what we did see was increased graduation rates. We saw improvements on test scores, in particular for students of color. We saw fewer suspensions in our students because we came together to say, what do we need to do as a community to help our kids? And so I would argue that what we need to do is more about collaboration and professional development, not about creating a differentiated pay schedule. Okay. So I, I have a feeling we'll come back to this issue <laughs> again and again. And, and I, I have a question later on that I want to ask. But, but I, I do want to uh, get a sense from you, too, um, about where we are today and where we need to go. You both mentioned the fact that we need more funding. So, uh, so that's, that's part of it. But, since 2013, the governor's big bet, Governor Brown's big bet, has been the local control funding formula, which I think does, how many of you in the audience know what, what we're talking about here? So just everybody does good. Local control funding formula. I would like to know, is it working or not? The basic idea of the local control funding formula was more funding for English learners, low income districts, um, and is that the formula going forward? And if we need more money, where are we going to get the more money from? Okay. You just asked two questions that we could spend an hour and a half on, I know. on each one. Um, so on low control funding formula, I think it starts with that. I think Governor Brown's leadership um, on low control funding formula, which gave more dollars to low income kids, English learners, 
and foster kids, the, the systems that run that, yeah. um, and also gave more flexibility for educators and school sites and school districts to make decisions with those dollars, I think was the most important piece of policy that's probably been passed in public education in the state, um, at least for the 15 years I've been leading on it. And I just think it was a, a really important piece of policy. Um, unfortunately, the implementation of that policy uh, is not aligned with the values of the policy that was passed. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's aligned with what was intended in terms of when the governor led on that because the money isn't actually all getting to either the kids directly that yeah. are from those demographics or to the adults that serve those kids. And there was a decision made by the current state superintendent to allow districts to use the additional money they got for English learners, foster kids, low-income kids for across-the-board raises and also for across-the-board cost of a district. And I, that to me was just hmm. uh, the wrong interpretation um, because that money needs to go. We talk about the achievement gap, we talk about equity. If we want to get serious about truly ensuring Latino kids, African-American kids have a real shot at a future, have a real quality education, we have to differentiate our supports and that money needs to get to them. So that's something that on day one, we're going to change that interpretation uh, when I'm in office and, it, and it's absolutely essential to do so. It's also a reminder that education, you know, a lot of us work in the field, it's policy plus implementation. If you pass a policy but actually don't implement it well, it doesn't change results in the field. Um, and, and so that's where having a state superintendent who's actually been an implementer, who's led school systems, that actually realized how do you shift curriculum, how do you shift instructional practices, how do you put together phenomenal professional development programs, how do you actually think about what leadership and what schools, like that's where we have to make real adjustments. And mm -hmm. so um, I think it's early, we, we, we need to implement that policy the way it's meant to be. Money alone doesn't solve the problem, we need money. Education, we have too much either or. We need more money, we gotta actually spend it better and make sure young people get it and our educators are supported in the way they get that done. Where do we get the money from? In terms of additional dollars, so you know, to me, you gotta look at our budget overall. One is, we gotta prioritize current dollars hmm. more for education. So current legislature, including state, uh, Assembly Member Thurman, I realize it gives them 30 more seconds, but uh, <laughs> last, last four years it has allocated good. $800 million annually more to prisons, $800 million more in the last four years, where we already are the highest cost per prisoner and we're also decreasing the number of prisoners. Like that, that doesn't work. Uh, we gotta move that over. I think we passed cannabis. We should move those dollars over to mm -hmm. education. We should fight for every one of those dollars. It's I think a couple hundred million now. I think it's gonna be a billion in a couple years. And then we gotta go look at the overall picture around, hey, are we making sure corporations in the state are paying their fair share in terms of property tax? I think there's interesting ideas where we see a lot of direct investment in real estate in this state. Do we think about actually think about additional revenue sources there because it's increasing cost of living? So we, we have to do whatever it takes. We can't have the best public schools in the country, which we should. We should have the best public schools in the country. If we're 41st in funding, we gotta do what it takes to get there. So would you support the uh, split role measure that's on the ballot, 20, that lo looks like it's headed to the ballot in Yeah, in terms of supporting corporations paying their fair share, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, that's something okay. I'll be pushing for. We, we've gotta, we, we have to increase okay. funding, but I know time's up, but it's time's worth up. it. Yeah, but we'll take five. Uh, <laughs> we gotta be transparent with how we're spending the money, and we gotta use it well, otherwise the public won't be with us. I'm not gonna equivocate in how I answer your question, Mark. Not only will I support the measure in 2020, I'm gonna lead that campaign to educate voters that split role reform can be done in a way that protects seniors from having to pay more taxes, protects homeowners from having to pay any more taxes, and protects small business owners from having to pay any more taxes. And at the same time, we can create $11 billion to support the state general fund, about $5 billion of that that can go directly to K-12 education. Um, let's be real that for decades, K-12 education and higher education have, been, have really been cheated because of large corporations that have had loopholes in how they pay property tax. And so I'm not gonna equivocate. I will tell you, I will lead the campaign to educate our voters. Because I've read the PPIC poll that says many voters are close to the threshold we have to pass, but they're afraid because they don't understand that this measure is not going to increase taxes for working people and for middle class people. So I will lead that effort. The local control funding formula is fantastic. Um, but it's not enough. It's a good start. And you know, I think we agree, Mr. Chuck and I agree on this. I think we agree that those dollars should be going to the students that it was intended to serve. We've both said that publicly. I think where we will disagree, and he will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I campaigned for Prop 30 so we could have uh, the local control funding formula. I campaigned for Prop 55. Uh, Mr. Tuck campaigned for neither, and his supporters 
ran campaigns against Prop 55 because they wanted corporations to be protected uh, against paying more taxes into our K-12 education system. I think a person who wants to be the state superintendent has to speak out against such action and be clear, we need the money, we need everybody to invest. I was on a school board in 2008 and it was the worst recession that we've seen in recent times. And the night I was sworn in, I was asked to vote to close 10 schools because the state budget was so bad. And they said, we want you to vote for this even though we know it's bad for kids, we're gonna ask you to do it anyway. And I said, if it's bad for kids, you lost me when you framed it that way. If it's bad for kids, we have no business doing it. We should have the political will to do the right thing to help our kids. I went out and talked to five different city councils. We got enough money to keep almost half of those schools open. They were high-performing schools that serve kids of color. And so what I'm saying is local control funding formula has been helpful, but it doesn't get us all the way there. It literally takes us back to 2008 wow. funding levels. And so we've got to do more. It's really to the statement about where the state is spending money on, on prisons, let me be clear, no one has done more than me and my colleagues to try and close the school to prison pipeline. Just this week, we sent a bill to the governor's desk that will end the cash money bill system. Uh, I think what Mr. Tuck was saying, because in all of our budgets, every one of our state employees got a raise, including individuals who work in some of our jails. If you think that the way that you end the school to prison pipeline is by telling people that they don't get a raise when they work in a dangerous environment, in a tough environment, you don't understand how we create systemic change. And a superintendent of public instruction needs to understand that you've got to work with the governor to get anything done and the legislature to get anything done. And I'm proud of my relationships with 120 legislators on getting things done. I am proud to have co-authored legislation that closes private prisons in our state but the governor vetoed that. And so we came back at it again with the bill that says tax those private prisons, and until they close, make those companies pay more for preschool programs because $6 billion of your hard-earned tax dollars are being spent on prisons. I'm proud of creating a system where we've made the first year of community college free, and we're gonna figure out how to lower the cost for higher education in our state. And I'm proud that in my time in the legislature, more than a billion dollars we have allocated for early education, because that's how deeply I believe. I'm not on the sidelines, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm out there fighting and getting things done. I'm not waiting to get elected to get things done. I've built a lifetime career of fighting for young people, of serving with young people, because I've walked the walk that these young people have walked. And together, we'll make sure that we get more revenue for our kids so they can have a quality education in our state. He mentioned your name. <laughs> well, not only mentioned my name, uh, <laughs> it communicated completely false facts. Hmm. And, and came out to my integrity a little bit. I mean, this is, the problem with politics is politicians with confidence say things that are false. I was fully supportive of Prop 30, fully supportive of Prop 55. If I remember correctly, I donated Prop 55. I, th there's no facts in what he says. And you think about our country right now, the environment, is there anything more important than our leaders actually communicate with facts? I was leaving schools in 2008 and 2009 when the budget cuts hit. It was brutal. Looking at our kids and our parents and our teachers, and we had to make just ridiculous trade-offs on just ridiculous cuts to funding. We pushed hard for those bills. We need more funding. So let's, I mean, we are in a tough environment right now as a society. We, we cannot be sitting here saying that we're gonna be role models for kids, the leaders on public education, and just tell just facts that are false. To, to the public, I mean, it, it's just completely wrong. So we gotta get serious about it, and we also get serious about actions and words, right? I was raised in a house with my mom, if you say something, you back it up. If you say something, back it up. Don't say things you're not aligned with your values on. Talks about, hey, we're aligned on low control funding formula, dollars for all the kids. Been in the legislature for four years. All it would have taken is a simple fix-it bill to tell the superintendent the dollars have to follow the kids. Didn't happen. L let's look at actions. But at a minimum, we're in education. We, we gotta lead with integrity, with honesty, and make sure the facts are right, especially in 2008, especially what's going on in our country right now. Okay, so. 10 seconds. Uh, 10 seconds. 2018, 10 seconds, excuse me. The, 10 seconds, start the famous my timer. 10 seconds. The bottom line is, you can point the finger at whoever you want, but our kids are risking everything. People ask me all the time why I would leave a job that I love in the legislature, and I tell them because I want my legacy to be that we've made public education better. And so if our kids are risking everything, I'm risking something too. I'm all in for our kids. And I'm telling you, unequivocally, I'm gonna continue 
all the things that I've done to improve money for K-12 education. We've piecemealed it together. You know, $35 million in grants here, uh, $300 million that we just put into the local control funding formula to support the lowest performing kids, but it's still not enough. I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm being about it. I've been about it and together we will do more to make public education in this state number one for all of our kids. Okay, so I have a question for the two of you. Um, you, you both pointed to the, the fact that we need more funds for K-12 education, some ideas about how we might get, get there. You've also pointed to the fact that we need universal preschool. Um, most Californians think we need universal preschool. Most leaders in the state have said we need universal preschool. The question has been around how are we going to pay for it? The concern has been if you take on the additional expenses of, of universal preschool, what is that gonna mean for the money that's available for K through 12? So tell me how we're gonna get there. I, I think the ballot measure in 2020 is definitely part of that. By most estimates, you know, providing a universal preschool program somewhere around $1 billion. You know, I asked the governor for $1 billion two years ago to support uh, the lack of affordable housing in this state. And he hemmed and hawed for the first year, and in the second year, we got a billion dollars. And I will work with the next governor to make sure that we identify ways to support universal preschool. And that means having a measure like the so-called Make It Fair campaign that will be on the 2020 ballot that would generate 20, I'm sorry, $11 billion more. And I think that we can designate and earmark a billion dollars for universal preschool. Uh, we can use revenue from some of the uh, cannabis you know, revenue, but most of that revenue is currently tied to programs that teach drug prevention. It is not a windfall of dollars that is currently available mm -hmm. uh, for use in K-12 education. Now, there are other measures that we could use to generate revenue for our school district. And one of the things I'll do right away is launch a working group of people who will help to identify where we get permanent funding sources to support our state. This will be business leaders. And this where might that be? I'm sorry? What, what would be some examples of where we might get permanent funding? Well, I think there are a couple of measures that are in front of us that we have to decide uh, whether or not we're prepared to do that. As you know, Mark, we, and all of you know, in our state, our state budget has operated off of a structural deficit for decades. Mm -hmm. And we literally, when we are in good times, we put money into the rainy day fund. We have more money in our rainy day fund. And as soon as a recession hits, we will go back to cutting things that we know we shouldn't be cutting in education, in healthcare, social services, until we create a permanent funding source. So the Prop 13 reform is one of the best ways that we can do that. We can look at other measures that have been raised, like whether or not there should be a statewide uh, sugar tax. We can look at measures that have been raised before but never acted on, like an oil severance tax. We have to compare what every other state does to figure out how we properly fund. But I believe that the best way to come at it is to convene business leaders, education leaders, civic leaders together, where their sole purpose is to identify where our opportunities are to generate the revenue for K-12 education. We've started that work already, and we'll continue that uh, into the time after the election. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it starts with- Where are we gonna get the money? Well, the, the broader question, so if we have to start with the change, it has to start with leadership prioritizing our kids. This state has been in the 40s on public schools funding per student for decades. Mm -hmm. We have not been in the 40s on spending on the environment per citizen in the state. We have not been in the 40s on spending on healthcare per California. We've not been in the 40s, we've been in the top 10 on cost per prisoner. We have made prioritization in our current budget. Other states are spending more in education mm -hmm. than the state of California. So, so we do actually have to prioritize in our current budget as well as find additional sources of revenue. We talked about pre-K, a billion dollars. The last four years, $800 million more on prisons. It's a, it, it's, I've, I've led big budgets, you gotta make hard, hard decisions. But when you have a situation where first-year prison guards make more money than first-year teachers, which is the case in the state of California, I'm okay moving 800 million bucks from that to pay for pre-K for all. In fact, not only am I okay with it, it's the right thing to do for kids. Mm -hmm. so, so we actually need leadership that's not gonna just go with the way it's been done. The system as it is with the current leadership in terms of Sacramento legislature has consistently said something for everybody. That's okay if education was top five or top 10. We've been in the 40s. So we have to prioritize public schools and kids, in my opinion, as the most important policy priority and also economic priority for the state for the next decade. 
So then how do we pay for universal preschool while we're increasing funding for K through 12 at the well, same I time? I think where, you know, where will be the source pre, of funds? Pre K, K 12, it's, it's pre K through 12. Like so you have to make hard decisions. So we're not, we talk about a 10 year plan. It's at least a decade to get from where we are to having a great school for every kid. Hmm. We, we just gotta be honest about it. You know, my consultants, the political, like, never say 10 years, say three years, two years, four years, you're a politician now. I'm like, not a politician. It's at least 10 years, I've done the work, at least. So the question is, what do you do first, second, and third? And that's where we talked about earlier, implementation. Having folks who have led large school systems, I've led two of them, who have had to make hard trade-offs on decisions. I say pre-K first, I also say free, free college if, if you commit to teach for five years or more because we have massive teacher shortage. Those to me are the two immediate economic priorities. Does that mean that the budget, we can't maybe spend something else within K-12? Yeah, you can. Like that's, that's the hard decision you have to make when you have d defined resources. So we gotta make sure that the current resources we have, we're spending as much as possible on K-12 from other areas. And there's no question prisons is a great way to go, but let's look at the whole budget. Let's see what other states are spending more on and less on, and let's figure it out. Secondly is let's actually make hard decisions on what are we gonna fund first, second, or third, rather than sprinkling across all different areas. And then we certainly gotta go and look at the overall revenue picture, but it just comes back to, we gotta have a state superintendent who actually has done the work and is focused on change. More money with the current system, the way things are just working, is not gonna work for all kids. And I think all of us, all of us in this room have one thing in common. We want every kid to get to be successful, but we gotta try something different to get there. And let's have our top education official be someone who's actually led large systems and done the work. And that's what our kids deserve. So I have a question from the audience, which is similar to a question that I was going to ask, but actually, um, I think, well put. More articulate, more eloquently asked. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll admit it. Ouch. Um, <laughs> what, are, what are skills you feel valuable in a 21st century workforce, and how can education help meet that? I like that question because, you know, education is going to provide the mobility for for. For, for, for people in California. And um, at the end of the day, um, that's very important for the future of California. So what skills do you feel are valuable? And how can education help meet that? Um, so you know, my son Mason is seven, he just turned seven, and he goes to our local public school in Los Angeles. So you think a lot about for my kid, um, you know, when he turns 18 and, and 20 and 22, you know, what skills do I want from him? And obviously, you, know, you think about, we should all collectively think about all California kids as our kids, but um, it's a different world and a different economy. And it's not just a different economy, it's a different world, which is a good thing, right? Empathy. How often do we say we gotta prepare our kids to be more empathetic in terms of when they're done with education? Mm -hmm. They should be. Understanding, less racist, more inclusive, strongly collaborative, highly creative, Strong core skills in math, science, computer science, English, social science, civics, voter participation. We teach civics when kids are seniors in high school, second semester, American government. I had a student, I was in a van, a young person came to me and says, I've never heard your position and I can vote. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a, he, was a, he was a fall semester senior. I take, I take American government next semester, 18 years old. Civics elementary school, right? So when you think about, I think when you think about 21st century economy mm -hmm. and, and 21st century society, because our job, I believe, in education is how do you prepare people to be employable, to be good citizens and good people, and also civically engaged, right? And how do you give them the best chance to be who they can be in terms of having the most fulfilling life? And, and we have an opportunity, I think. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm 45. When I was in elementary school, middle school, Man, we never talked about diversity. We never talked about learning differences and special needs, mental health. Like the opportunity we have to really reshape things in terms of who we are as people, in addition to actually ensuring high quality skills that you can, in a shifting economy where you've got to change jobs all the time, where you have your base core skills across your core subjects, but the skills around learning new skills, creativity, collaboration, like we can do it both. And it'd be awesome if we did it, but it requires us to reimagine our public schools. I dropped Mason off at school, and, and I dropped him off in his, in his first grade class, and it doesn't look that much different than my first grade class from 39 years ago. Like, the world's changed a lot. Um, so, so we gotta prepare him for all of it, but the opportunity, we have kids in class, 
pre-K to 16, hopefully, pre-K to 12, pre-K to 14, from 8 a.m. till 3 p.m. If they're after school, till 5 p.m. What if we did an incredible job from 8 to 5, 8 to 3, every day? Just did an incredible job. Like, not only does each kid have a better chance, a better future, you just got a dramatically better society. Schools can't solve it all. It's not all on us. But we can do a lot more, and we got to imagine it was possible, and it has to start with change. It, 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 it has to start with innovation and change. I think we teach our kids to read. We've always said, if you learn to read, then you read to learn, and that reading is a gateway for anything that you might want to do. I think we should continue to emphasize critical thinking for our kids, not memorization, but by helping our young people to be able to figure out situations and to be logical in how they approach things. We should be providing more experiential learning for our kids. The best way to teach science is when kids can touch and feel. And we take young people out to you know, the beach to see the ecosystem to learn what's in their textbooks so that it comes alive. Because sitting in a classroom for 45 minutes and having someone just talk at you and talk to you, it doesn't work. I see it all the time with my adult colleagues We're in, and, and they're playing with things because they can't handle just being talked to. Young people are no different, but we continue to approach K-12 education in that way. Let's get them up and on their feet and learning and giving them the opportunity to learn about civics. And when I taught the civics course to this high school group last year, um, we talked about American government and how it works. And then I challenged this group of students to write a bill. And these were 16 and 17 year old students who wrote a bill. And then I invited them to come to the state capitol to introduce that bill in the legislature so that the idea of government could come alive so they could see for themselves, so they could touch and feel. And these happened to be students who were uh, committed to a juvenile camp because I wanted them to think that their life could be different, that perhaps by being on that assembly dais, they might see that they too could serve in the assembly. Because you see, in my life, no one in my family has ever been elected to anything, not even dog catcher, you know? But we have been having conversations about diversity in education my entire life. I was a student who was bust in a desegregation program, and majority students in, my dish, in the neighborhood were white, and kids of color came from all over the city to get an education. So I knew right away that there was something different about my neighborhood school than what was happening in another area. There were kids around me who were saying that they were gonna go to college. I didn't always know what that meant, but they said they were going to college. I said I was going to college too, right? My mother's an immigrant who came from Panama. Right, to be a teacher in San Jose. My father emigrated from Detroit, Michigan and couldn't wait to get out of there and ended up in the US Army in <laughs> Vietnam. I found my father on the internet 10 years ago when I was 40 years old. That was my introduction to the person who gave me life. Uh, we, I say all that to say that we've been having conversations about diversity in education my entire experience. I say that to say that you know, as, a, as a person of African descent, of, uh, you know, who has immigrant parents and grandparents, you know, when they have conversations about bilingual education, it's meaningful to me because I was raised by a cousin who's fluent in Spanish and never spoke a word in Spanish to me unless I was in trouble. Go get the chancla, you know, that's all I heard. <laughs> because she grew up in an environment that said English only. And that's why as a legislator, I'm proud that we gave $5 million last year to recruit more bilingual educators to say we'll never live in an English-only environment. I'm proud that just before I walked in here, I got a call that my, my dual language instruction bill um, passed. Uh, I think that these are the skills we want to create. Students who are global thinkers, and I'm very proud of the bill that we passed that says every single school district in this state has to have a student school board member on it who can vote to give a student perspective to shape all the things that we do in K-12 education. I think these are the skills that our kids need to have. Okay, a number of, a number of uh, questions that came in from the audience touched on the issue of uh, th this one, and I, I want to ask um, both of you, specifically, what will you do to support programs for non-English speaking students? First okay. Well, as I mentioned, I'm very proud that our bill to promote dual language instruction okay. literally, <laughs> literally just passed, yeah. and it's on, it's on its way. And tell it, us how that will work. What it does is it provides more resources for doing early instruction for students who, for whom English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. It also recognizes that language development um, you know, supports brain development and that we can create global thinkers in the world, and mm -hmm. so that we will provide more resources uh, to support students who want to learn another language. Okay, so the, maybe we can get another question, and let's hear what you would what you would do in this area. 
Yeah, so I, I mean, I've done it. I mean, we, we, the schools I led were all in, in Los Angeles. We had over 30% of our kids English learners, and you have mm -hmm. to address the issues comprehensively, right? Mm -hmm. One, you have to ensure that we've got consistent, high quality instruction in front of our kids that are English learners on a regular basis, and that actually doesn't always happen. You have to provide training, not just the teachers who are teaching EL, but actually the entire staff, as well as the administration, the principals, to ensure you have a culture at your school and a skill set to best inter meet the needs of English learners. We extended zero period and seven period, seventh period during the day, so we actually had more time, because we found a lot of times our EL students needed additional time, because they're both learning the core subjects plus language. We actually had our parents come in that were parents of English learners and help walk them through what their kids were going through and how they could support them at home. So you had to look comprehensively how you address this issue um, and, our, and our kids soared and, and, okay. and we've got real work to do. Thank you. Let me ask you both another question about um, our students today and how to prepare them. We are looking at a workforce skills gap in California because we're not producing enough college graduates. What are you going to do to get more students college ready? Do everything we talked about for the last hour and a half, uh, and, and, and that's going to lead to everybody. No, being I, I able just to go I think ultimately you talk like when you think about you know college ready students, and at least to me, start step one is giving them the opportunity, right? Access. We, I, I open this thing with talking about equity, equity, the reality that uh, for a long time and still in many school districts, our low income kids actually were never even offered complete A through G courses. We mm -hmm. took over schools in two thousand and eight. Uh, and we had a majority of our kids that actually weren't offered a full A through G course. So mm -hmm. step one is you actually gotta make sure you're offering kids the courses, right? Step two is we talked about pre-K, you gotta start earlier so you're not actually falling too far behind. Mm -hmm. Step three is you gotta invest in your teachers and principals. So, so I, it's kind okay. of a bad joke, but systematically it, it, needs to be, it needs to be changed and I, I think it does come back to the question of like how do we fundamentally shift our pre-K through 12 mm -hmm. systems so we're getting a lot more kids college ready and it's gotta be with real change. And how do you see it? Every student should be given the foundation to be able to go to college, whether they choose to or not. And we shouldn't de decide you go here or you go there. So we have to get serious about our conversations about college and career readiness. Uh, and so for those reasons, I've invested already. The bill that we passed this year, we, we've been able to put $300 million into the state budget for career technical education mm -hmm. to make sure that our kids get access to apprenticeship training program and vocational education if they want it, but they also get access to internships. The best way to learn about where you want to go to school or what you want to do is to get some experiential learning. My 15-year-old daughter, who attend, all, both of my kids attend public school and they're great kids, she says she wants to be a nurse. And, and so we helped her to get an internship so she can learn a little bit more about what happens in the nursing profession. And so we do have to make sure that all students get access to the A to G requirements, but it's time to look at how we expand the A to G requirements as well. Um, we can do more computer science. I believe that we have maybe 20% of our districts that offer computer science in our entire state. We should have K-12 districts that talk about computer science, and I've introduced legislation to help get there. I'm proud that we spent, we've funded this year $15 million for after-school STEM education programs, because it's been shown that sometimes kids' best learning in STEM happens in the, the after-school program, but we have to prepare our teachers to be able to do more around STEAM and STEM education. And I say STEAM because I think that the arts have a critical role to play in what we do in our schools, and that I'm proud that we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars through the State Arts Council to make sure that we expand arts. It shouldn't be that arts only go to the schools where the parents and the parent club have the ability to pay a little bit more. Our kids should have access to every program, arts and others. And so we've got to do more on the next generation science standards to make sure that our kids understand you know, you know, core ideas and that they understand science and engineering and that they understand um, practice and that they have a chance to touch and feel. But we have to encourage our students that they can attend. And many of our students have been discouraged. They've been told that college is not for them. And we have to change that narrative. That's why I'm proud that we've made the first year of community college free for all of our students. I'm very proud of the programs that we created that allow for dual enrollment where our students in high school can simultaneously be enrolled in a, in a community college. And some of our students will graduate with 30 and 40 credits while they're in high school towards their college degree. And then they'll transfer into a UC or a CSU and save money. We have to spend more money, <laughs> we have to spend more money in supporting our UC and CSUs and our community college systems. We have, and the superintendent is a trustee for, for CSU and, and, and UC. And we have divested in these. I'm proud that in the last four years, we have provided billions more total for UC and CSU 
and community college, but it is not enough. We have to continue to invest more in these institutions. We have to have more full-time faculty. We have to have more students of color and more faculty of color. And we have to say that anybody who wants a college education can get one and that we won't let price be the reason that you don't get one and that we commit to making sure that every one of our students gets that chance. Going to college saved my life. I did not know that I would have the opportunity. When I, I, I attended a, an enrichment program to help me prepare for being in college. When I ended up at college, I, it was the first time I ever got elected to anything. I got elected to student body president. And we, we introduced policies to increase higher education dollars. And it, a light bulb went off that maybe one day I could have a career as a public servant to make my community better. Now, it would be 20 years before I would ever run any, for anything. But that's where it began. Because some friend talked me into running for student government, and I saw that there's a way to make your community better. Today, you heard a narrative that suggests that being a politician or elected official is a bad thing. I'm proud of the almost 12 years that I've had as an elected city council member, and as a school board member, and as a state assembly member, working hard to find solutions for the problems that we face. Anybody can say what they're going to do. When you make your decision who you want to serve you, I hope you'll look at my track record of delivering as an elected official and saying, even though we've done a few good things, it's not enough, and our kids deserve to have more. I'd love to be your so, state so, superintendent so, of public instruction. Thank you. So I, I want to, uh, if you can each answer this question briefly, then there will be time for a closing statement. So that's the incentive, OK? But it's an important question. It's an important question. I don't want to. I don't want to get off the stage without addressing for each of you and briefly, please. Uh, where do you see the role of charter schools in your plans for improving California's education? I'm happy to start. Yeah, well, it's, it's your turn. Go ahead. Um, charter schools clearly have provided an alternative for parents and families who've been concerned about their neighborhood school. Um, you know, I've been a school board member and I've authorized and renewed charters of high performing students that have served students from low income backgrounds and kids of color. Um, I have, in the last year, visited several charter schools that have specialized charters. One that serves African American students. Uh, last week I visited a charter that serves Native American students and has found that many of our traditional schools have been unable to serve the needs of Native American students. And I've visited a charter school that serves students who want to um, have access to military, uh, a military future. And so clearly, there is a role for our charter schools. Um, I, you know, as a school board member, I built a state-of-the-art high school campus that was shared by a traditional high school and a charter public high school together on the same campus. I believe that we have to change the narrative here. And as superintendent, I will serve all students wherever they attend. If they attend the traditional public school or a charter public school, I'm going to serve all of the students. They all deserve to have a great education. I do think that there are questions of accountability for charters that must be addressed. And yesterday, uh, Assemblymember McCarty and I sent the bill to the governor's desk that will forever ban for-profit charters in the state of California, because public education is public education, and no one should profit off of our kids. That's, that's just straightforward. I've supported legislation that says charter schools cannot cherry pick kids and push out kids who have a special education need. We need to make sure that our kids are served at all of our schools. As I said, I believe that there's a place for all of our schools and I'll serve all of our students. I do think we have to have a conversation about how do we go forward in public education. Charter law hasn't been reviewed for decades and now I know that the current superintendent has appointed a commission uh, of, of folks who come from all backgrounds, some who are charter leaders, some who are from traditional schools, to look at where we go forward uh, as it relates to charter schools in the state of California. Charters were created to provide innovation, and I think that there is a role for them, but I think we have to have a conversation about how do we do this where it's not at the expense of any student. Um, one thing I've learned from serving with this current governor is you don't start new programs without providing revenue for how to serve those programs. And I think that is a question that has not been answered as it relates to charter schools. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what is the tipping point? How many new schools can we handle before we've undermined the education of students in the K-12 education system, whether they're in a traditional public or a charter public school? I think that going forward, we should change this whole narrative of charter versus non-charter. And let's talk about what's best for all of our kids. And when we see great things happening in a charter, let's replicate that in a school that's not a charter. But let's be clear that we need to provide funding for all of our schools and make sure that we provide a great education for all of our students. 
you know, our job as a state is to provide every single child a quality public school. Like th that's our job as a state. And um, I think we should use every single tool we have in the toolkit to do that. We have traditional district public schools. We have magnet public schools. We have alternative public schools. We have continuation public schools. And I believe that nonprofit charter schools, particularly serving low-income communities that have been neglected by the system for decades, uh, are a good part of a public education system. And I think about uh, my dear friend Shirley Ford, who unfortunately passed away not too long ago, who was just a real advocate for kids. And I met Shirley in 2002. And her son Robert was finishing the eighth grade in Inglewood, and he was set to go to Inglewood High School. And in 2002, Inglewood High School had a 4% proficiency rate in math, and it had tons of violence on campus. And Shirley did not have the money to move from Inglewood to Redondo Beach or Pasadena for better public schools. She certainly did not have the money to go to a private school, which are the decisions that most folks with options actually take. And so she took a chance on a school that we helped create together, Animo Inglewood, uh, a school that I helped lead in, in 2002. And Robert went to that high school, finished high school, went to college, graduated college, and now he's teaching calculus in low-income communities in Houston. Right? That's, that, that's what's possible. And that, to me, is a good thing, particularly in a community like Inglewood, which had been ne neglected for decades, a school that, district that still the state took over six years ago and has actually gotten no better. Like, she deserved an additional public school option. That being said, we got to be thoughtful about policy. As the Member Thurman mentioned, we haven't updated the charter law for 25 years. Like we have to look at it. We gotta make sure that we have real transparency in charter schools. We gotta make sure actually that ineffective charter schools should be shut down. We've done a very bad job, both districts and the state, at shutting down charters that actually weren't working. That's something we're gonna change out of the gates. We have to be more proactive about collaboration between charters and the districts. The state, what I'll do at the state level is, let's bring together districts and charter school operators to work together to solve problems together. And let's also think about, for districts that have large number of charters, letting them be held harmless for a couple additional years as if they have to actually make some adjustments to their cost structure. We actually have hold harmless for a year if districts lose enrollment as it is. Think about extending that if you have unique charter growth in a certain district. But this is an area of, of difference between Assembly Member Thurman and I. He's, he's called for a pause on any charter school growth. I do believe that nonprofit charters that serve particularly low-income communities that the current system has failed for decades, that those parents deserve an additional shot, because middle class and upper class parents have never, ever, ever been stuck in a failing public school. Never. OK. So a minute, a, minute from, a minute from each of you about uh, why you're running this year and what kind of superintendent you would be if you get elected. And then a big applause for, from, from everyone. <laughs> I, went last, I went first last time. Great. Um, I'm running for state superintendent because every single child to have a chance at a great future, they have to have a quality education, especially in the 21st century economy, the most competitive economy in the history of humankind. Like, we have to give every single a shot. If they don't get a quality education, their chance to have a life where they can buy a home, fulfilling life, it won't be there. And right now, we are not getting it done. I've led education, I've been leading education for 15 years. I led two different school systems, all serving high poverty kids. First was a charter school network, the second were district public schools. We had some of the greatest success serving low-income kids in the country because we invested in our teachers, we got our parents more involved, we believed in every single kid. We can bring real change, but there's a real difference in this race. I think if you want real change in our public schools, then I'm definitely the candidate, and, and if you're feeling comfortable with the current direction and, and think more dollars alone solves the problem, then that I'm not, but the status quo isn't working. We need real change, and our kids absolutely demand and deserve real change, and that's what I'm going to drive and, and bring to the table. Thanks for today. Before you are two people who want to help our kids. Uh, I don't doubt that at all, Mr. Tuck. And I think we both have had probably about the same amount of years in schools, in different roles, of course. Um, he more as an administrator, me as social worker, teacher, after school program, mentor. Um, social worker, that sort of thing. Um, our paths have been different. Uh, and uh, my path is one that I think that my lived experience of relating where many of our kids are uh, has informed me on why this job is so important. That my experience as a school board member who was able to come to a district that was in receivership, to get that district to pay off its debt five years early and get it out of receivership and restore it to local control. Uh, to have had an incredible career as an elected official, where I get reelected with 90% of the vote 
every single time I run. Maybe the highest percentage in the state. And to make the decision to take the biggest risk to run for this office, because I simply believe that education can save a life. It saved mine. I hope that you'll consider the experiences, the lived experience, the elected experience, and that today I've come to you with ideas about a vision for going forward. Not pointing the finger, but saying that together, we must do everything that we can to help each and every one of our kids have a great life. I'll see you on election day. Let's give a big hand to both together. our candidates.